Hi everyone and welcome to this talk on snakes. This will be a beginner level talk for people who don't know much about snakes or anything about snakes and particularly new residents or people who are uh, interested in learning more uh, who live around Malhar. This talk will be focused on snakes in general but uh, particularly on the snakes that you find around Bangalore and uh, in particular Malhar. Uh, we work as a team. There are a handful of us who occasionally conduct rescues and uh, conduct these awareness programs. And uh, today you'll be learning a little bit about uh, what it is that we have been doing, what it is we've learned, and uh, hopefully you will learn, uh, you'll take something back with you as well. So we had this talk a couple of days ago on as a Zoom call and uh, we've recorded the call which will be attached right after this. However, the first couple of slides uh, weren't shown um, and the recording started a couple of slides in. So I'm just going to fill you in on uh, the bits that got cut out of the original recording. This is also the first talk in the, uh, hopefully what will be a series of talks under the Wild Malhar Initiative. It's a fairly new initiative that a few of us have started and it will be in the form of a website that anyone can access uh, and learn about the wildlife that's found around Malhar, from birds to snakes to insects to you name it. Uh, if, we can, if we know it, we'll try and put it up and uh, hopefully that will be up very soon. So yeah, here we go. Let's just jump right into it. So in our first slide, I'd like to just show this beautiful illustration. Um, it's a, a very special species, which you don't actually find around Bangalore, but uh, it would be a miss to have a snake talk and not touch upon this species. This is, um, for those of you who don't know, this is the king cobra, and these are two hatchlings that are coming out of their eggs. Um, this is a drawing that was made by Sangeeta. Uh, she lives in, in Footprints and she is a wildlife artist and illustrator. This is uh, a species which is interesting for many, many reasons. Um, but uh, the, the one thing that they do, which almost no other snake in the world does, is they construct a nest. and. For a snake which doesn't have, uh, you know, arms or legs, that's quite an amazing thing to do. So let's just try and understand a little bit about snakes, and let's just start at the begin, uh, at the at the very basics. Um, this is a photograph from Central Africa of a. It looks huge, um, but it's actually a very very tiny snake. It's called, uh, I think it's called a hairy bush viper. And they're very, very interesting. You know, they, uh, you can see from the photograph that they have these uh, scales which point, which kind of curve out away from their body. And that makes them look a little bit like dragons. They are venomous. Um, and we have a very similar type of snake in India. Uh, and those are our pit vipers. They're along with the bush viper in this photo, they are uh, snakes that are generally found in rainforests uh, and don't often come into contact with people. So yeah, just to start at the beginning, um, snakes are uh, completely limbless, they don't have arms or legs, and they're reptiles which are found in almost all parts of the world and they've, they're also found in almost every habitat that you can conceive of. Uh, from the rainforests that this uh, pit viper is found in, that this, sorry, bush viper is found in, uh, to the deserts and uh, rivers and even the oceans. They have uh, bodies which are generally quite long and slender, and they're almost completely covered in small scales. And the only places where you see uh, a break in the scales is usually the eye or when they open their mouths up. Snakes can be, you know, all different sizes. Uh, 
shapes and sizes and some of them are just a few centimeters long uh, some like the uh, some grow to several meters long as well and since they are reptiles that means that they're cold-blooded and uh, the meaning of the phrase cold-blooded is that they can't control the temperature of their own bodies the temperature is controlled by the environment that they're in so if a snake um, wants to raise its body temperature, it has to go to a surface that's hot or it has to sit in the sun. And if it wants to cool down, it needs to go to a cool place and rest there. Uh, in comparison, you know, humans like us and a lot of mammals uh, have uh, homeothermic bodies, which means that we get heat from uh, the food that we eat and the digestion and the uh, breakdown of food that we consume. Almost all snakes are predators. And what that means is they have to hunt and kill their prey in order to eat. In certain situations, they may be forced to take other types of food, but that's usually quite unnatural. And uh, as you can see from the photo here, uh, photographs here that you, see, you can find snakes in a variety of different habitats. Uh, so while a lot of snakes live on solid ground, uh, there are others like the uh, yellow-lipped sea crate, uh, which are adapted to swimming in oceans. Uh, for instance, this blunt-headed uh, blunt snake from uh, South America, which is uh, excellent at climbing trees. There are also a small number of snakes which uh, you can find underground. They have adapted to live specifically most of their lives or all of their lives completely under the ground and we rarely see them. And it's this amazing ability that snakes have to colonize all sorts of different kinds of habitats and that has allowed them to exist virtually everywhere on our planet. So a little bit more about um, snakes and you know how they see the world. Uh, all snakes have a really well-developed sense of smell, and this is a big way of uh, this is a big part of how they understand the world around themselves. So unlike us, uh, they smell through their tongues, and uh, they use that's why you keep seeing snakes flicking their tongue out. So scent particles that are in the air are picked up by the tongue and they're processed in a special organ, which is inside the, the mouth. Uh, it's, got, it's on the roof of the mouth and it's called the Jacobson's organ. Now, the reason that the tongues of snakes are forked in this way is so that they can understand direction better. And, uh, you know, they have two different prongs to this tongue. So if a scent particle is stronger on one prong, they can tell that that's the direction they either need to go to or avoid, depending on whether it's food or whether it's a predator that they're uh, detecting. A lot of snakes have extremely sharp eyesight and especially true for snakes which live on land and in the trees. They rely on their vision to get around and to hunt their prey. Those that live underground, however, tend to have pretty poor eyes and uh, that's because vision doesn't make much sense when you, when you live in that kind of habitat. There are a few species of snakes which also have a special organ on their face uh, which helps them detect changes in temperature. Um, and these are a few, there are a few pythons and uh, uh, a, a small number of vipers which can do this and that allows them to hunt uh, in, in almost pitch darkness with uh, a lot of efficiency. Just hang on a second. Uh, I'm getting another call on uh, with regards to the snake. I'm just going to take a second to mute myself and check on this. Yeah, I think as you can see, uh, and I'm sure pretty much uh, most of you are aware, uh, probably not the, some of the newcomers uh, who might have joined this call, but uh, that's how wild we are. We actually have pretty much almost on a daily basis uh, uh, snake sighting which happens. And I think uh, Chayanth will probably be able to share some of the 
uh, numbers uh, in terms of documentation that he has been keeping a track of over the period of last uh, several months uh, in terms of snake sightings and rescues that we have done. Yeah, sorry, I had to take a couple of seconds out. So I think they caught, caught the keel back in the end. Oh, cool. Okay, so just getting back to uh, just getting back to our presentation. Uh, so snakes have uh, snakes have interesting lives. They're they're born alone, uh, and they hatch from eggs. And they all snakes have to fend for themselves from the moment that they're born until they die. Uh, so the photograph that you're looking at on the right side is uh, two rat snakes which um, uh, two male rat snakes which are fighting one another they're engaging in something called male combat and it's a territorial behavior where uh, which you can see in the summer months uh, which is during the mating season and on the left uh, you're seeing a mother snake uh, this is a ringed snake from europe and uh, you can see that she has her clutch of eggs that she's incubating uh, unfortunately, only a few, of, like this is true for a lot of egg-laying egg uh, animals and in fact a lot of animals that give birth to many young, it's only a few of the babies which were going to survive until adulthood. So in India, in South India particularly, a lot of snakes are born right after the first rains, which is, uh, you know, about now, just uh, in, the last, in the last one month. In order to be successful hunters, um, each species has its own specific set of adaptations and a few of them, you know, chase down their prey, a few of them strangle their prey. Uh, they have a whole lot of different techniques and uh, tools at their disposal. A small number of them also have evolved venom, which uh, not only help them catch and kill their prey, but also to digest it once they've swallowed it. So what you're looking at over here is uh, a snake that's in shed. As snakes grow, they, they must shed their skin and this happens uh, throughout their lives. So when a snake is about to shed, um, people who are familiar with that species will be able to tell uh, their colors become a little dull and you can see the eyes on this one are uh, quite a cloudy blue. Sometimes it's a cloudy gray. So what's happening is the outer layer is separating from the, the new skin which is formed underneath. And there's a kind of fluid which builds up in between which allows them to you know, slip it off. It's like a lubricant. So that causes uh, this dull discoloration. And during this time, because the eyes become cloudy, so because they're, they're, they're basically like looking through fogged lenses and the snakes become they're, they're quite vulnerable because they can't see uh, too well. So as a result, if you come across a snake like this, it's uh, quite likely to be defensive and might bite if you try and pick it up or approach it even. However, as soon as the shed is, uh, the skin is shed, this is the same species of snake. Um, the colors and patterns are the brightest and most vibrant that you're going to see of that species. Snakes can, again, find me perfectly, uh, they can see perfectly again, and uh, they generally become a lot more docile because they can see things from a distance and they can assess whether it's a threat or not. Uh, pretty much all snakes grow from the moment they're born until they die, they grow throughout their lives. So this cycle of shedding and molting uh, continues through their lives as well. So in India, where uh, we're ex uh, are you able to see this screen? Oh uh, no, no, I don't think so. It's a blank screen. Blank screen. No. Okay. I'm just going to uh, skip ahead. I had a few different photos of different snakes from India, but uh, what I just wanted to pass on is that there are you know over 200 different types of snakes, and uh, some are found throughout the country. Others are found in only very small pockets. So the largest snake that we have in India is uh, it's the reticulated python, which uh, 
It's been documented to grow almost seven meters long, which is massive. It's also one of the heaviest snakes alive. Uh, the smallest snake, on the other hand, I, I saw one just a few days ago outside my house. It's called a worm snake or a blind snake. They're also called uh, thread snakes. And uh, those are generally, you know, they fit in the palm of your hand. They're just about 10 or 15 centimeters long when they're uh, full grown. Uh, and of all these different types of snakes, some are feared, uh, many are feared, uh, but in some places they're tolerated by people and even worshipped. Um, in other parts of the country, in a few parts of the country, they are also hunted for their meat, but uh, this is not so common today. Uh, however, despite whatever reputation they have, whatever people think of them, Snakes really want nothing to do with us, and uh, they usually try and stay away from people if they can. Right, give me a second. The presentation seems to not be showing up too well. I'm just going to try a different route. All right, let's see if this works. All right, is this better? Yep, yeah. Awesome. So, yeah, so this was the slide that I was, uh, that wasn't showing at first. And uh, you can see the, in the top left, you have uh, the largest venomous snake of India. Uh, it's also the same one that Samhita drew on the cover. This is the King Cobra. And that's a photo from Agumbe, I think. Um, just below that, you have... Uh, the, so the king cobra is only found in a few parts of the country. It has a very patchy distribution. You get it in the Western Ghat rainforests and you get it uh, in parts of East India. So like Orissa, West Bengal, Bihar, going up into the Northeast. And you get it all throughout the low-lying parts of the Himalayas. Um, the, you also get them in the Andaman Islands. The photograph below it is of a, it's called a sea, it's a type of sea snake. Uh, there are many different types of sea snakes and uh, they are generally the most, uh, the most, they have the most potent venom of all snakes in the country. Uh, you only find them out in the open ocean and uh, uh, occasionally they do come to land. Um, the top right, the red and black beautiful striped snake is uh, a type of coral snake that you find only in parts of, uh, I think only in Karnataka actually. It's uh, all the records I've heard about are from Kur, but there might be a few from other places as well. These are snakes which uh, generally live in the leaf litter or just underground. And uh, you don't see them very often, but when you do, I mean, it's quite a sight. You can see that it's just so colorful. And uh, the bottom right one is um, another venomous species. It's called the Andaman Crate. It's, um, it's amongst the most venomous snakes that you would find in the Andaman Islands, but it's found uh, nowhere else. So in Malhar, uh, I told you, in India, there are more than 200 or 250 different species, but in Malhar, there are considerably fewer. Uh, we've been looking at snakes here for the last maybe uh, five or six years. And since then, we've seen a total of, I think, 16 or 17 different species, uh, either inside Malhar or on the roads just next to it. Um, you know, this land has been home to snakes well before people were on it and uh, hopefully it will be home to them well after we're gone. Uh, most of these snakes aren't, uh, aren't dangerous to humans, but there are a few venomous species as well. So, a little bit about a few common snakes that you get. Um, these it's possible to see these if you're uh, around Malhar with a bit of luck. So on the left, you're looking at uh, a rat snake. 
this is the same species which I showed earlier where there were two males uh, intertwined in each other fighting. The rat snake is, um, it's also known as, uh, you know, the farmer's friend. It's a huge species of snake and, you know, they really big, they grow up to six and a half feet, almost seven feet long. And uh, they're extremely efficient predators of, uh, of rodents, which is how they get their name. Uh, rat snakes are snakes which only come out during the day. They sleep at night. And uh, the one that you're looking at in this photo is one that uh, is a well, it's a well-known resident from Footprints. Uh, she can be seen over here in her favorite spot, which is just outside uh, Vivek and Brinda's house in H Cluster. Uh, and what she's doing here is she's uh, raising up her head to, you know, make a periscope type uh, uh, shape with her body. And rat snakes often do this so that they can get a better view of what's going on uh, around them. They're really active and strong snakes, and they move very, very fast. Uh, so they they will chase down their prey, and they can outmuscle most of what they catch. Uh, these are snakes which don't have venom, and so they have to use you know their speed and their strength uh, to their advantage. So the way that you can tell that this is a rat snake is uh, you can see that between the lip scales on the mouth, uh, there are black lines that separate them. And that kind of, I mean, in my mind, that gives the impression that the rat snake is, uh, you know, perpetually smiling. So on the right, uh, you're looking at a, a, a water snake, it's called a checkered keelback. Um, this is a species of snake that some, some people have said is probably India's most common snake, you know. Um, it's, you can find them in almost every single pond, well, lake, or river in the country which has clean water. They're not as big as rat snakes. They're just, uh, they're generally only about three or four feet long. And uh, they live in and around water, and so they, they primarily feed on uh, fish, uh, frogs, and toads, which are all, you know, slippery, fast moving in water. So the snake as well is extremely fast when it's swimming and uh, its strike is extremely quick as well. They kind of do this side swipe of their mouth uh, to get, so where they swim alongside their prey and then will suddenly thrash to one side to catch it. Occasionally checkered keelbacks can come onto land as well uh, and they're not as proficient on moving on solid ground as they are in the water. Uh, in fact, they're one of the few species which, if they're really trying to move quick on land, they will actually sidewind, which is uh, uh, a species. Uh, it's a behavior you see in only a few species, where uh, they try to they touch the ground with only two or three points of their body and keep the rest of it above ground. It's a, quite a strange uh, thing to watch. I, I don't have a picture of that, unfortunately, but. Um, it's there in basically every snake documentary or uh, snake horror movie. So this snake gets its, uh, it's called the checkered keelback. It gets its name from the patterns on the neck, which you can see are, uh, they kind of look like a checkerboard. And these, these guys have awful tempers. You know, they're not dangerous to humans, but they will give you a really nasty bite if you try and pick them up. And these bites will often, you know, draw a lot of blood. They do have a mild venom, which is something that I didn't know until quite recently. Uh, but this isn't dangerous to people. And uh, they're active by both day and night. The one that you're looking at in this photograph, where uh, it will actually come into a house in Mosaic. And... Uh, I think they had a pond inside their house. Uh, but the cool thing was when we found out about it, someone went, I think Prakriti went and checked. And uh, uh, they kind of, the residents had adopted the snake. They were quite happy to have it around. So that was, that was quite a nice thing for us to see. 
So the next, uh, the next species is, it's not a very common species, but uh, in Malhar, but it's one of my favorites. It's called the vine snake. And it's a very specialized species that spends almost all of its life in, in the trees and in and amongst foliage. Uh, like most tree snakes, uh, vine snakes have bodies that are even more uh, slender and long than than most uh, than other snakes are, and they have this so that they can climb better and they can camouflage well in their surroundings. And because they camouflage so well, I mean, you can tell from this photo that uh, if you didn't know the snake was there, you'd probably think it was just part of the plant. Uh, so, because they camouflage this well, they can afford to be very slow moving and uh, they hunt ex by, you know, relying on being slow and not being detected. You can see the head is also kind of long and pointed and it's kind of shaped like a pointy leaf. Um, the cool thing, I don't think you can see it in this photo, but the cool thing about uh, the heads is that they have an eye with a horizontal pupil, which means it goes across the, uh, the eyeball, which is quite strange. Um, other animals that have pupils like this are horses and I think uh, goats. But uh, nonetheless, vine snakes have amazing vision and uh, they rely mostly on vision to, to catch their food. They're not common, like I said, around, uh, around here. And I think we only see uh, like two or three of them a year. Uh, and, but I have no idea with whether this is because they're rare or because you know they're just hiding in plain sight. They're so well hidden in the trees. We've, uh, All of that, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Chayanth. What? All of those sightings are generally uh, only to Chayanth. So if you want to really take a look at uh, wine snakes, you should spend more time with Chayanth. I mean, I think I, I've started to learn how to find them well now, but uh, even during, even for me, I find it quite hard during the day to, to spot one. Um, in the past, I wasn't there for this, but uh, Prakriti and a few others have seen vine snakes, uh, you know, stalk and catch uh, these big lizards that are around these garden lizards, which are quite large. They're about, you know, six or seven inches long at least. Um, and vine snakes are also known to eat frogs and small birds. Uh, they do have also a mild venom. Again, it is not dangerous to humans. The other cool thing that uh, vine snakes do is, this is something that vine snakes, a few vipers and maybe a few other species do, uh, I'm not sure, but they don't lay their eggs. They produce eggs which are inside the mother's body but the eggs hatch internally. And this makes it look as if they're giving birth to live babies, which uh, was something that, you know, we initially thought only mammals had the capacity to do. And that's still true, only mammals can do it, but uh, this snake gives the appearance of doing the same thing. And it confused a lot of people when they first found out about it. Vine snakes, uh, again, are only active by day. They sleep at night on, again, on the branches of bushes or trees. And as you can see in the photo over here, like their bodies are a plain uniform green. But um, in, over here, you can see the threat display, which uh, vine snakes will demonstrate if they feel, uh, if they're afraid of uh, something that's approaching them. And they do this really, it's really cool. It's kind of like how a cobra spreads a hood, uh, but they basically inflate their bodies. And this shows you the skin underneath, which has this amazing black and white pattern. I think in some places, uh, there's also black, white, and brown or some combination of that. And they all, they'll usually open their mouths really wide and face whatever it is. Uh, it's all a bluff, I mean, they will strike at you, but they can't really do much to you. Um, but it's all a ploy to scare off the predator. All of these features, the open mouth, the inflated body, the amazing pattern, 
you will almost never see this unless uh, if a wine snake is just out doing its own business. You will only see this when it feels threatened and when someone picks it up. This, this actually looks like uh, when you look at an image or I mean a pixel or the display and then use probably a, a microscope to look into the display. It looks like that pixels, each of those pixels. Yeah, like they're that. elongated rectangular pixels instead of square yeah. ones. Yeah. So there are two more species over here. Um, they're both small snakes. The one on the left is uh, called a common kukri. And um, they're, these, they're these quite drab snakes, I think. I mean, they're, uh, they have these olive brown bodies which are, they really, the prominent thing is these black stripes which are across the body. Uh, we don't often see them these days because, and I think that's because they're active, you know, mostly just after sunrise and just after sunset. And that's when the light is kind of poor, so it's hard to see them. But snakes that come out during this time, um, you know, they, they, they occupy their own special niche in, in the whole system. Um, kukris are defensive sometimes when you handle them, but uh, other times they can be completely, uh, uh, they, they can be very timid and the one in the, in the photo that you're looking at actually tried to hide its head when I picked it up. Uh, they get their name from their teeth. The teeth inside are shaped like uh, the kukri knives which I think are from Nepal or uh, India and Nepal. Uh, so the teeth are shaped quite similar and they use these teeth to slice open reptile legs, which are often quite soft and leathery. And this makes up a huge part of their diet. So they, they don't hunt live prey. I mean, they don't actively hunt prey. They're going and finding nests and raiding them. Uh, Sometimes they do also feed, feed on uh, lizards and frogs and even small rodents, but this is hard for them because they're quite small snakes. Kukris, I also recently learned, are also mildly venomous. And now I understand why, because I've been bitten a couple of times and you do notice a little more pain, uh, a little bit of swelling and sometimes bleeding that doesn't stop for a little bit. Uh, but like I said, this species is not considered dangerous to people at all. The one that you're seeing on the right is, <clears throat> I think it's easily the most colorful snake that you'll find in Malhar. This is in fact the species that uh, uh, Rajesh just called and said was found in uh, which Tejas and Satish went to rescue. Uh, it's called a striped keelback. And they're very, very mild-mannered snakes. They almost never bite. Um, the one that you know you're looking at in this photo, it was found in the guard cabin at uh, the footprints gate. And when when we came up to it, it didn't even try to escape. It just coiled up and allowed us to pick it up without you know making any kind of fuss. Uh, they striped keel bugs come in at least two different color variants. So uh, the one that you're looking at over here is, you can see that the upper body is quite red. And uh, there's, another, there's another kind that you get, which instead of red, it has a, uh, like a sky blue or a gray blue pattern. Uh, these are snakes which are usually associated with farmland and water, and they love to eat frogs. They are also active uh, only during the day. Uh, and this is a, a photograph of a baby. It's a newborn striped keelback. I think just a day or two old. This was um, uh, quite cool. A few years back, I think it was in 2015 or 2016, um, in footprints in Arti's house, uh, she started realize she started noticing every morning for three consecutive days that there were uh, there were these tiny snakes coming into her kitchen from her back garden, and it turned out that uh, a keelback had come and made its nest there uh, several months earlier, probably, and all the babies started hatching when the rains arrived, and I find this species like the baby 
to be just adorable. Like it has, it has such a massive eye. It looks so cute. It, uh, it this was the variant which has the sky blue uh, or grayish blue color on the upper body, and uh, they're just gorgeous little things. So there are a few snakes also. The snakes that I mentioned so far have been, I think all have been mostly active by day or day and night. There are also snakes which come out only at night. And this is a species that does so. It's uh, the common wolf snake. And this is a species which is also found very close to people. Like they're almost always found near houses. And that's because they make their, ho their homes in the, in the cracks of walls or in between roof tiles. Uh, in fact, there's one I noticed last week and up to, I think, two days back. There's one at our house as well. Um, my mom, I hope she's not watching this because she has a phobia of them and she doesn't know about it. But um, yeah, they, they make their homes so close to people's houses because they feed on these small geckos, which are the lizards that stick to walls and uh, come out at night. And uh, the geckos tend to tend to come close to you know the light bulbs on our front porches. So wolf snakes are attracted to that and uh, hang out near them. It's actually the geckos are also there because of food. You know, light attracts insects, and that brings uh, geckos, which bring the snake. So you're seeing the full. full uh, food web or uh, food chain or whatever illustrated with just this one species. Um, sometimes the species does come into houses as well. And while they, they can be defensive, they're sometimes quite quick to bite. Uh, the wolf snake is really funny. Its bite sometimes doesn't hurt. Um, and it's really funny to watch them try to bite someone and you know, uh, it try to bite you in fact and uh, you can't feel what they're doing. The species also is uh, an excellent climber. Like I said, they make their way up to the tiles of your roof sometimes and uh, it's amazing. I've seen them scaling walls which are almost completely smooth without breaking a sweat. I, I have no idea how they do it but they're amazing at it. So all of the snakes that we mentioned so far are the uh, harmless or uh, yeah, the more or less harmless to human species. Uh, there are a few, as promised, venomous species that we get here. And uh, there are four. Um, some of them are more common than others. Uh, and they are collectively known as India's big four. They're uh, responsible for the most, they're, they're extremely widespread and so they're responsible for the most snake bite related deaths in India. So on the top left, you're looking at a spectacle cobra. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen too many cobras, this might look strange because, you know, you'd be wondering where the hood is. Uh, this is a cobra that has not yet been disturbed uh, too much. And uh, you can see that its body has gone into these tiny curves that it's gotten really rigid, but it's not yet uh, become so afraid that it has uh, decided to spread the hood. So as you can see, uh, uh, this is also the most common of the big four in Malhar. Uh, they're, they're extremely common. Uh, the bodies are usually a plain brown or maybe like a wheatish color. And uh, when they get agitated, they can spread the ribs around their neck. And that's how they make that hood. Uh, and the cool thing is that hood also has a, it usually has a spectacle like uh, marking on it. Uh, cobras are generally quite shy snakes. Um, they don't really try to, you know, they're not aggressive towards people. Uh, they can try to defend themselves, but uh, they really prefer to stay away and to avoid biting. They're active by both day and night, but you usually see them in the afternoons. And they often feed on frogs and rodents. They're also the largest of these four snakes. Uh, they can grow to, you know, well over five feet long. And... Uh, 
just below that on the bottom left, the black snake is a snake which is closely related to the cobra. It's called a crate. Uh, this is the common crate. And it's also quite a secretive snake. You, you rarely see them. And they come out you know, only after it's dark. You will never see a snake uh, that, you will never see a crate come out during the daytime unless it has been disturbed. Crates are usually this really, I don't know if uh, it's not so clear in this photograph that I've selected, but their bodies are like this shiny bluish black or brownish black. And they have these very striking bright white stripes usually uh, all along their bodies. Uh, usually only near their tails, but when they're younger, it can be across their full bodies. They're, they're much smaller than the cobras. They usually uh, don't grow beyond three or four feet long. And they specialize in eating other snakes. They will take the odd frog, but their main diet is uh, other smaller snakes. We haven't seen too many of these around Malhar, and it's usually just you know a couple of times a year. Um, but the venom is probably the most potent of all of these uh, big four. And in India, in North India, they seem to cause a majority of the snake bite related deaths. Jayant, uh, just yeah. one second. Uh, just point out, crates don't eat dead snakes. They, uh, they eat live snakes because there were some questions in Malhar some time back on whether snakes eat dead snakes. Uh, they don't eat dead snakes. They eat, they catch and eat live snakes. That's right. I mean, this is true for most snakes. Um, they almost always take prey that is alive. Uh, and uh, this is true for a lot of animals, uh, except for scavengers, which specialize on dead animals. Um, most wildlife won't take, uh, you know, dead dead things, which are which they already find dead. And that's because, you know, it's it's kind of instinctive. Uh, the dead animals can be, you know, uh, places where diseases breed. You, 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 can't, uh, you can't trust meat that has been out for too long. And uh, so, yeah, crates along with other snakes will take live snakes. Um, just next to the crate on the bottom right, with greenish photograph, that's the... That's a young individual of a Russell's viper. And this one was found in footprints. The cobra on top was found in resonance. Uh, the Russell's viper was from footprints, I think. And this is a, it's a viper species, which is extremely well built, uh, meaning it's quite, it's quite a stout bodied snake. And they grow quite large, uh, you know, four feet or more sometimes even. And during certain times of the year, they seem to become common around Malhar. And at other times of year, we don't see them at all. Uh, so we're still trying to understand why that happens. Um, you can identify a Russell's viper really easily. Their entire body is covered in uniform, you know, uh, round markings, which sometimes spill into each other and look like a bit like a chain. Um, they are active by both day and night, and they mostly eat rats. They're, because they're so well built though, they, they end up being quite slow moving in general, but they can strike extremely fast, faster than almost any other uh, vipers in general can strike uh, amongst, uh, they, they are the quickest strike in snakes. Uh, Russell's vipers are known to give, you know, a kind of warning just before they bite. And that's in the form of this really loud hiss. Um, some people say it sounds a bit like a pressure cooker. And in South India, Russell's vipers cause a majority of the snake bite related deaths. They're extremely powerful snakes and they're not, uh, they're not a species that you should underestimate. And the, in the top right, it looks big in the photo, but this is actually quite a small snake. It's the saw scale viper. And uh, it's really tiny. I mean, uh, they hardly ever grow over a foot or a foot and a half long. They're also 
rasu wipers and sawskill wipers uh, stay a little further away from houses than cobras and crates do and sawskill wipers for instance have never been seen inside malha but uh, there have been a couple of stray sightings on the roads uh, near tobile and anchipalya so since they're so small they they mostly eat invertebrates like insects scorpions and centipedes and they i think i read somewhere that they get most of their water from uh, their food so they do, they don't uh, actively drink water like other snakes do uh the sawskill viper also i suspect that it's becoming more and more rare around bangalore uh, it seems to be getting pushed further and further out of the city okay so just a quick um just a quick um, uh infographic over here to show that there's only a small proportion it's uh, it's like a quarter of all snakes that you find over here that are actually venomous uh, or have potent venom most of the other snakes like 75% of the other snakes are either completely harmless or um, you know, completely non venomous or have venom that's not significant to people uh before we continue we're uh, we're almost at noon does anyone want to take a break or ask a question or anything like that uh, nandan or should we just you can uh, 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 unmute yourselves if you have questions so there was one on the chat group where they were asking how do you differentiate between a wolf and a crate yeah they're they're tough snakes to identify that's a that's a good question they're both black snakes that are covered in light colored bands and they both come out at night um i would say there are ways to identify them uh it's based on how the scales are and how the shape of the snake is and also the size but generally if you see a black snake at night uh and you you're not sure which of the two it is it's always safe to assume that it's a dangerous snake and just give it a lot of space you know stay away from it treat all snakes as if they're dangerous if you're not sure about the identity okay so um you know why are snakes why are snakes important why is it important to have them around uh snakes are actually a sign of a very very healthy and functioning ecosystem Uh, so it means that you know your environment is doing well if you have snakes um they have been useful in advancing certain fields of medicine in the past but the number one reason that snakes are needed and that we need snakes is because of rats india has uh, it's no secret a huge rat issue uh most countries do but being predators snakes are responsible for keeping the populations of uh, many species including rodents under check and uh, the reason that this is necessary is because rodents have a huge impact and they're very difficult for us to control they not only affect uh, produce from farms but uh, because they hold a lot of grains but uh, they also carry you know several different kinds of diseases and their populations grow at an exponential rate um rodents also have a lot of predators but snakes are the most efficient of all of them uh, there is no other predator that i know of that can follow a rat you know into a small hole and catch and kill it uh, inside like snakes can snakes also have uh, several threats that they face uh, this is sorry a graphic image um, on the left you can see uh, the that's a, actually a small cobra which was in footprints and uh, uh, i'm sad to see that that was our cat that ended up killing it um cats are domestic and feral cats both they kill wildlife across the planet at huge rates it's really quite disturbing and those of you who are you know bird watchers will also know that uh, a lot of birds that are nesting are extremely vulnerable to cats um 
a lot of snakes also get run over uh, because they come onto roads to warm their bodies on cool evenings and uh, because roads retain a lot of heat and they a lot of them come under the wheels of vehicles so this is on the image on your right is a russell's viper you can see that beautiful pattern that was quite a big individual and i think it had been run over you know just a few minutes before i came across it and lastly uh, threats to snakes are uh, habitat destruction and loss of their native habitat this is not just true for snakes this is true for almost all wildlife that as human activity displaces them they, their populations become very very threatened oops all right so there are some snakes which are dangerous some of us don't like snakes how do we avoid them well Snakes are attracted by certain things that uh, we, can, we can take away. So it's not possible to get rid of snakes completely. And uh, as I just said, you know, it's not recommended either because they're needed in many ways. But um, they can be prevented from taking up residence just next to our, our homes. And it's not too hard to do that. Uh, what snakes come close to people's houses looking for is shelter, which, uh, you know, could be in the form of like construction material, or uh, it could be like an over, overgrown garden. Um, snakes can take shelter in these very easily. Uh, really under any loose material, they can, they can uh, hide. And so if you take that out and you make sure that there's nothing, that the gardens are neat, that your backyards are neat, this, is, uh, this becomes a huge deterrent to snakes. And the other thing you can take away is their source of food, which uh, quite often is, for a lot of species, is rodents. Uh, rodents are uh, not as easy to contain, but you can avoid having rodents go crazy in your area by making sure that kitchen waste is disposed of efficiently. Um, yeah, I think a rat-proof house is really the best way to keep snakes away. There are, of course, many other proposed solutions like, uh, I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, you can plant this plant, you can uh, build this thing and in your garden and it will keep snakes away. And like people can try that, but uh, I don't think that they, these are tried and tested methods. Uh, I don't think that they've been proven to work efficiently. But nothing is worse than this, which uh, some of you might have seen if you've tried to ever look for a snake repeller. Or maybe you've gotten a WhatsApp forward with uh, something that looks a bit like this. Uh, I think this is a solar powered device and uh, you stick it in the ground and apparently it generates you know, vibrations in the soil which are supposed to keep snakes away. Uh, it sounds pretty good and I, I, I'm sure it makes a lot of sense, but from what I have been able to tell, it does not work. And um, these you know, forwards still keep going around, but I know of rescuers who have gone to houses which are infested with snakes, not, not here, though in Australia. Uh, that country has massive, uh, a huge population of snakes. And quite often he'll, this guy will go to houses and uh, they'll have, you know, 10 of them, a dozen of these uh, repellers put in the ground in the, around their property. And the snakes don't care. So yeah, avoid buying stuff like this uh, or buy it, but I think it would be a bit of a waste of money. The other way we can avoid snakes is by taking uh, some precautions. So whenever you're going out at night, I would recommend using a torch. And that's even if it's just around your home, uh, because snakes can be really hard to see unless you're really actively looking for them. A lot of people do get bitten when they are close to their own houses. And sadly it did happen last year. I think it was last year. Uh, that someone did get bitten in patterns, uh, Shuti. And uh, luckily nothing happened to her. It wasn't a venomous bite, but uh, she did have to go to hospital and it was quite stressful for them. So do be 
on the lookout when you're walking around by day or night and at night especially do use a torch i would recommend only walking in places which are well lit and where you can see the ground because uh, even if there are just loose leaf litter on the ground there could be a snake under it and uh, if you do have to walk somewhere where you can't see the floor wearing good footwear uh, wearing good footwear can create a, a kind of barrier so that's also uh, a good practice and most importantly i would say children need to be taught not to reach into bushes or into places where they can't see um you know not to reach in with their hands to get you know a toy that's lost or something because that's also a extremely dangerous situation um i think uh, in 2017 there was a boy who got bitten in resonance also and touch wood it wasn't or something dangerous or his bite wasn't a serious uh, bite but it is a real possibility um and you know what do you do if you see a snake so uh we've gone over this multiple times but uh, for those who haven't heard of this before the most important thing is to allow the snake to move you know especially if it's out in the, in the open if it's not near someone's house just let the snake pass and uh, nine times out of 10 i'd say 10 times out of 10 the snake is going to go on its own way uh, it's important during that time to make sure that children and pets are kept away and uh, to to quickly inform one of us one of the rescuers so that we can know that it's there we don't have to rescue it if it's not needed but we will know that it's been seen uh you can watch the snake you can photograph the snake uh, just do I it i can't hear you time hey sorry <clears throat> is it uh, is it breaking up no 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 froze for a minute now it's fine good okay yeah i would say you know watch the snake photograph it uh, try to learn about it but do it from a safe distance um definitely do not try to catch it and don't try to go too close for chasing a photograph um and i would also recommend uh, not asking people who haven't been trained like uh, some of the guards and uh, staff to catch the snake because if anything happens to them uh, they may or may not be insured and it's very difficult to figure out what to do in that kind of situation but most importantly we also don't know how they will treat the snake you know if they can catch it safely or not so it's important not to kill or injure the snake in the process and most importantly yeah give the snake space so don't spread panic don't allow too much of a crowd to come try to uh, try to control the crowd a bit so this and the next few slides uh, people who are interested can screenshot or just leave it on the screen for a couple of seconds and of course what happens in the unfortunate uh, incident that someone's bitten so i would say the first thing to do in this kind of situation is again please screenshot this page um but the first thing to do is uh, to contact one of us one of the rescuers get some advice from them um because you may not be able to remember all of this or find your screenshot or whatever so contact one of us we will help you out and it's important to get away from the snake um safely so if you can remember what the snake looked like that can be helpful if you need to go to the hospital but most importantly stay calm um a lot of people go into shock you know just because it's a very stressful situation staying trying to stay calm or if you know someone who's bitten trying to reassure them can go a very long way i know it's easier said than done but uh, this is why also contact one of us we we have a little bit of experience now with these kinds of situations so we can help and uh, it's imperative that you get to a hospital as quickly as possible one that is equipped to stock uh, to treat snake snake bite victims so the two hospitals that i know right over here are uh, bgs near uh, near uh, 
of the Uttarali main road and uh, I think the other one is Fortis near in Nagarbagi. Both of them are... Uh, uh, one, one thing, uh, I had heard that this RR Nagar hospital has uh, uh, anti-venom too. Yeah, I had also heard that. In fact, a friend of mine who was who had uh, who's a doctor had a colleague there, and both of them said that uh, Aranagar is equipped. But I think two or three times that we've tried to send people there, there's either been you know no doctor on duty if it's late at night or whatnot. It's a uh, it's a bit of a gamble. It's worth checking out. But when you're in this situation and you need to get treatment fast, um, maybe you don't want to waste the time or go through the stress of trying to figure out whether the hospital will treat you or not. Uh, so I, I wouldn't risk it. Uh, RR, medical hospital, uh, or college and hospital, which is at the corner here. I have, I have something to tell. Yeah, so it would be worthwhile if we can maybe do some homework and see whether they are better equipped now. But uh, in the meantime, BGS and Fortis are the best bets. Uh, of course, in this situation, if you get a bite, uh, don't try and you know catch or kill the snake to identify it. And uh, uh, there are a lot of bad practices that uh, you know are in our cultural mindset of you need to cut the wound or you know suck at the wound to get the venom out. This is, I think, a, a Western idea from the 50s or 60s, which has been proven not to work in, <coughs> in a lot of situations. Excuse me. Uh, hashtag coronavirus. Um, also, there are a lot of, in India, we have a lot of um, uh, people who, who would seek alternative rem remedies like uh, uh, I mean, there are there are many, but I would just suggest that they are avoided because uh, uh, we don't know whether they work well. And hospitalization and antivenin treatment is the most uh, effective way to deal with snake bite. So it's important not to waste time and to get that done quickly. Um, I'm just going to put up another screen where. You can see the snake rescuers. I, I hope I've included everyone. I might have missed out someone or the other, for which I'm sorry. Um, Prakriti's phone number, <laughs> I realize I have not put. Um, but please screenshot this if you need it and uh, keep it handy. Maybe print it out and keep it on your uh, fridge or door or something. Uh, and this this just shows you, you know, there are quite a few of us who can come in the end and help out in the case of like a snake or a snake bite situation. Um, moving on, the, this is what we end up doing when we have to actually conduct a rescue. Uh, we usually only do this if we feel that either the people or the snake are a danger to one another. Uh, sometimes it is a venomous snake and you do need to remove it. But uh, other times, you know, even if it's a harmless snake, uh, people might be quite excitable and worried and uh, you don't know if you leave it, if people will kill it. So we do rescue them. The, so the photo on the left is one technique of rescuing, which is you use a stick and you hold the snake and you direct it uh, in, the, in the photo just next to it with the blue bag. You can see that's a cobra in both of them, which is going into this uh, trap that we've made. Um, the you know, yeah, you know, the, there are two photos in the middle of Russell's vipers being one of them being caught, and the one the center top photo is of it in a bucket. And the last photo on the right is uh, uh, what we do after we catch, was we do document all of the sightings that we hear about, and this helps us learn a lot. Uh, so over the last six years, we've, I think we've seen, and uh, we've seen around close to 700, 600, 650 to 700 different snakes, just around Malhar. And um, I think on average, it's something like 25, uh, maybe 20 to 25% of these are situations where we need to actually do a rescue. Uh, 
Um, and since we've started doing this, the number of snakes that people have intentionally killed has had a huge uh, decrease, which is really good. I mean, that's the reason we started in the first place. And it's nice to see that uh, people have responded well also, you know. People are now, I think, more likely to call us than to uh, try to take the situation into their own hands, which is great for the snakes and it keeps people safe as well. Uh, I'm just going to show a couple of uh, things. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, of course. Once I'm saved a snake. Yeah, you did. Yeah, I did. What snake was it? Uh, it was just a black color snake, a huge one. I didn't know what was it. A cat was going to kill it. I was, It was went to the dining hall in school. And then I was just standing there. The snake got scared. It went away. That's nice. I mean, you did that without even touching it, no? Yeah. That's that's the best way to catch snakes. So that's good that you, uh, I mean, to rescue snakes. So that's amazing. I'm nearly done with um, the presentation. I just want to show a couple of, you know, trends that we've seen. Uh, so this is what we've seen over time. We've, uh, we've tried to keep a record of all the sightings that we've known about. And um, this is what we've learned. We've, we see on average, we get about 120, 130 snakes seen every year. And um, there seems to be some clear seasonality. That's the graph on the left. But the graph on the right shows that there's some clear seasonality where you get certain months where there are a lot of sightings and certain months where there are fewer. So typically in the winter, which is, you know, December to February or March, sightings are quite low. And then when the summer picks up and the rains come in, in June and uh, October, you get two huge spikes of sightings. So we're in the middle of that swell right now. Uh, we just had, we just come out of May, which was probably the hottest month. And we saw a heck of a lot of snakes in May uh, in, and in April. I think in April we saw 30, 30 odd species, of, uh, 30 odd snakes around Malhar and in May it was something like 50 or 51. So uh, the next couple of months are going to be a bit like that. Um, and moving on to like, uh, I think this is kind of interesting. This is, uh, this is just showing you how rat snakes are doing over the years. So you can see the graph goes kind of up and down and uh, but there seems to be a slow increase in uh, sightings of rat snakes. This is uh, the striped keelback, and uh, it shows uh, the complete opposite trend. You know, you can see that clearly from 2015, where uh, you're getting more like 35, 40 percent of all reports were of uh, striped keelback. We've come down to barely five or 10 percent now, and not even that. So this species seems to have just uh, declined rapidly and uh, it's possible that we'll soon stop seeing them around Malhar. But um, let's see what the trend ends up being, you know, another couple of years down the line. It's really nice that they managed to see it uh, today because apart from today's sighting, uh, the only recent ones have been from Mosaic. Uh, this is a graph of uh, how cobras are doing. And they seem to be becoming more common. I'm not very sure. Uh, I also don't know why, but it is true that in, um, in undisturbed uh, environments, you don't get cobras very commonly. You get them, but you get a whole lot of other snakes as well. But uh, as places become more developed and people settle into them more, cobras seem to take up, uh, uh, they seem very well adapted to live alongside people. They're kind of, I mean, I've started referring to them as the pigeons or the rats of the snake world because they're just exploding in population in cities like Bangalore and I'm sure most Indian cities. 
So the point of all these graphs is not really to uh, uh, try and to, to say that it's happening because of this or that, but uh, it's just to show that, you know, by, by keeping a record of snakes when we see them, we can learn quite a bit about them. And I'd encourage every one of you to spread the message that even if you don't need the snake rescued, if you see a snake, do tell us so that we can keep a note of it. I'd just like to uh, open up the floor now for uh, other members of the rescue team. So I'm not sure, uh, maybe uh, Prakriti or uh, Nandan, can you just go around and see if there are any other rescuers or people on our group who would like to share their experiences? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think before that, uh, there are a couple of questions. Maybe we could uh, just quickly answer them and then... Uh... Let's do the questions right after. Okay. All right. I think uh, we can have, uh, you know, other people also answering questions. I've talked for a long time and I'm sure people yeah. are tired of that. So we can mix it up now. Sure. Shall I start? Yes, please. Yeah, so uh, personally, um, before I moved to Gujarat, I think uh, I, I was scared, I was like totally scared of animals, um, let alone snakes, uh, any kind of uh, wildlife or animals. Uh, I mean, I, I would appreciate them from far, but um, never ever had ventured to anyone. And that small uh, keel back that uh, Chayant uh, showed you, he was my next door neighbor and he one day just got came and put it on my hand <laughs> and that's the first time I uh, even like saw a snake so close uh, and from then on I think uh, I think for me what uh, has given me the uh, courage at least to uh, be a part of the rescue team and uh, is I mean what you see about snakes in movies that they're going to chase you they're going to like <laughs> revenge and come and bite. I, I think all that is so, I mean, it's, it's just a myth. It's, uh, it, they are more scared than what you are. Uh, just one tap uh, of the feet and they just run. So, and there are many times when, you know, when, even when we're learning to rescue, even now I'm, I'm scared to rescue, but I, I can easily sense that the, the snake is more scared. Uh, you know, we're trying to hook, put it into the bag, try to hook it. And uh, they're still so defensive. They're, uh, we've hardly had any situation where they actually, uh, you know, hunt, uh, strike back at you. Or, so they're very docile that way. Uh, we've really not had any problems with <laughs> any of the snakes. I think the snakes are also well-trained by giant. <laughs> so I think, yeah, uh, it's, it's a fear that, uh, you know, as soon as you say, see a snake, I'm, I'm sure that's the case. Uh, but yeah, you just need to learn to live with them. Is anyone else who would like to uh, share their experiences uh, of being part of the rescue team? Wait, do we even have anyone else on the rescue team over here? Satish, where is Satish? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm there. Hi, hi, Satish. Hi, uh, Just a few points to, you know, in addition to what Chayan said a little earlier about uh, you know, walking with torches. The other thing I've noticed, many, many people walking uh, at all times of the day, looking at their phones. Uh, I don't know if they're looking at interesting WhatsApp messages or they're looking for directions or to go to the neighbor's house, but uh, uh, not a great idea, right? Because, um, you know, if you're not looking where you're walking, it's, it's like, as Chan said, it's, it's very difficult to spot snakes, right? And uh, while, you know, quite a lot of the snakes will move away in general, right? Depending upon... Uh, you know, how fast they see you and things like that. Um, sometimes they won't, right? And they just may be cornered. They just might not be enough space. Um, 
or if it's snakes like Russell swipers, some sometimes they just don't feel like moving away, right? And uh, you know, if you're looking at your phone and walking, that's not in general a good idea. I've seen just too many people do this, and I just wanted to call that out. Uh, and it's not just snakes, but you've got a few other interesting animals around Malhar, in, interesting insects. Uh, there's a whole bunch of scorpions, and there's a whole bunch of centipedes, both of which can give fairly nasty bites. I mean, they're not poisonous, but uh, you get bitten and you're not going to be enjoying it at all. Right? So uh, that's one thing which I would like people to kind of pay attention to. Um, in fact, you're more likely to get bitten by wasps and centipedes, scorpions than by snakes, right? And uh, you know, those are things which we don't pay much attention to, right? Because somehow, you know, they don't come into our radar. Right? So that's, that's uh, just one point. One more point which I want to add, uh, Satish. Yeah, go ahead, Satish. Sorry. Pan Malar audience says, um, you know, one of the things we have seen is a lot of snakes have died because of rash driving. Uh, uh, so it would be really good if people can go slow on the road till the church uh, turning, because we have seen at least one or two deaths every month, or maybe more sometimes. And maybe share it with your communities to uh, take care when they're driving on these roads. It's not only the snakes; it's also other animals and birds which are on the roads. Maybe some small kids were playing as well. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. that's a nice message. Uh, I actually think the hashtag "I break for snakes" would be uh, would be great to use. Um, but yeah, you know, this is the this is the monsoon full in full swing, so uh, snakes will be coming onto the road. Uh, very often and it's hard to see them anyway, but it's re it's impossible to see them if you're going about like 40. So do be careful if possible. Uh, we can avoid quite a few of them dying. Chayan, there's a question which people are asking, are snakes territorial and do they come back after the idiots? And maybe you should answer them. Do they come back after? So we rescue and release them elsewhere. So, yes, uh, from what I do know, snakes are territorial. Uh, whether they come back or not, I can't be 100% sure, but there are quite a few snakes where we can recognize the individuals. You know, if we get a really big uh, rat snake, for instance, you, you'll be able to recognize him, you know, just by the life stage that it's been in. And there aren't that many of them around. Or if it's a cobra they have, or a Russell's viper, they have very distinct patterns on them. And if you're paying attention, and that's why we also do the documentation, if we get good photos of them, if you get a good look of, at them, we're sometimes able to tell individuals apart. So from what we've seen, we haven't been able to see confirmed cases of snakes coming back. But uh, there was one instance where there was a cobra in patterns in a house that hadn't yet been fully constructed. And uh, I took it out and I took it to the other side of the wall um, and released it into some thicket there. I think two days later, it showed up in the same place. So the reason that that happened was because there were uh, uh, creepers leading all the way up from the outside over the wall and back down on our side. You know, that's just like a staircase for the snakes. So in that case, it did happen, but that was one time out of, you know, 600 odd times. So I would say that uh, snakes generally don't come back. Uh, I think they might be, they might learn which places are uh, full of people and, you know, being rescued is quite stressful for them, even if we do it nicely. Um, so they probably learn and try to avoid those places once they've uh, encountered people. Uh, that's my suspicion. And uh, people will, will know more about this as time goes by. But yes, they are territorial. Uh, people have tried to, you know, stick trackers in snakes and uh, in, in India and in other countries. And in India, we've done it on king cobras. 
And uh, yeah, they do have territories. They will defend their territories. Uh, the snakes that were uh, in the earlier image of the rat snakes uh, uh, in the male combat, that was for territory and for a right to mate with a female. So yeah, it does happen. Just like with dogs or tigers or most animals. Uh, Chant, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Kathar. Uh, does tapping uh, your feet while walking, does it help to create vibrations? Yeah, that's something I didn't touch up upon uh, much. But yes, snakes uh, can, they are very aware of vibrations, especially through the ground. So walking with, a, you know, walking with a loose, uh, even a loose chuckle that slaps the ground or heavy boots that, you know, make a stronger impact that definitely uh, will draw a lot of snakes away from you. But like Satish pointed out, there are some species which uh, like Russell's vipers or a snake that's just eaten or one that's just too cold to move. Uh, and in those kinds of cases, you know, the, the snake may stand its ground and may not get out of your way. So it's important to look as well as to walk heavily. Okay. But yes, it does help. And growing up, I was always told to you know walk uh, strongly and not to creep around. Okay. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for the question. Oh, also, like, yeah, uh, please, guys, feel free to jump in. Uh, Vinay, Prakriti, Satish, all of you. Uh, Sorry, we lost you. I hello. Yeah, now we can. Yeah, I was just saying, feel free to jump in, uh, Prakriti, Tejas, Vinay, uh, you know, uh, Nandan, Satish, all of you are uh, responding to the questions also. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think we can probably open it up to questions. Uh, anyone else uh, asking uh, any, any questions? Oh, yeah. Someone had asked how to keep a toddler safe as they are not, they're very curious. Uh, so like clothing or something. Someone had asked that. Yeah, Chen, that was me. This is Shreya. So the question that we had is that uh, so we have a daughter who's 14 months now and she loves wandering around the garden and she, you know, goes out and she's in the lawn a lot and she obviously doesn't understand if we tell her that something is safe or not safe. Yeah. So what can we do to ensure that uh, she's as safe as she can be. So does protective clothing of some sort help or what do you, do you have any recommendations on that? So, yeah, I mean, thanks for asking. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm no parent myself. So, you know, I can't even imagine how, uh, what the worry must be, but I'm sure it's very, very real. And uh, I completely understand. Um, I think, the thing is, the fact is that anywhere outdoors is potential snake territory in Malhar. And uh, so, you know, the outdoors here need to be treated like outdoors anywhere, even in the city. Um, like toddlers will be maybe in some common spaces which are safe, but as soon as you get near the road, uh, things are dangerous. And so when they're wandering all over the place, it has to be kind of supervised if possible, or else it, the free roam has to be limited to inside the house only. Um, generally, it's possible to make your garden a little less inviting to snakes, but um, it's still, you, there's always the chance that some snake or the other will come in. So... Yeah, I would try and uh, recommend keeping her uh, keeping her unsupervised roaming indoors and let the outdoor one be supervised as much as possible. But maybe some of you all who are uh, parents and have had similar issues will uh, talk about that. Yeah. Shreya, um, e echo what Jayan said. I don't. I won't recommend unsupervised roaming outside. Uh, as I said earlier, it's not just snakes, but whole bunch of things like my kids uh, daughter when she was small got bitten by um, uh, ants we call them fire ants but they're actually something else um, and it created a fairly bad reaction right uh, 
there are other stuff also the scorpions the centipedes which you see fairly often so you know the garden areas um, don't you know unsupervised roaming i'm not sure is a very good idea um, in the house is okay so that's the only it's not i don't think you can completely you know keep your house or the child safe from all of these things the other few things is uh, you know right from an early age piece tell them not to go and uh, stick their hands and feet into bushes uh, right that's the you know you, simplest thing right even for kids that age you can tell them not to do it and they understand it fairly well uh, right? so that's that's just a couple of suggestions um shri do you have anything to add pretty much uh, both chant and uh, satish have given uh, the right uh, advice and suggestion uh, while i'm sure that you may have situations where you may not be able to supervise uh, as well i think uh, sensitizing them uh, from this young age uh, itself is going to uh, go a long way in terms of they also trying to stay away from harm uh, inadvertently because uh, for example i have uh, my younger daughter who is uh, uh, almost 3 now uh, we have been here uh, for more than 2 years now so she was a few months old uh, when we moved here and uh, uh, for about at least a year or so now uh, we pretty much sensitized her about the snakes and she's seen snakes around here and uh, while she does uh, play with uh, a age group kids a couple of them here they pretty much are also aware so i think while uh, you need to ensure that you are there you also need to ensure uh, educating them uh, i think it's going to go a long way in terms of them being aware while they are playing even while supervising them because a lot of times you might be sitting somewhere far watching them but then the reaction time may be not enough for uh, you to take appropriate action so that's always going to be useful when Hey, Nandan, we're losing you. What I'm saying is, uh, can't hear. Can't hear you. Hello. Yeah, it's a little better now. Yeah. So what I was saying is, uh, while you should supervise. It, Uh, you should also educate the little ones uh, and uh, with their curiosity i think they will also uh, get to understand uh, uh, some of these things uh, at a younger age while you sensitize them so i would say uh, both should go hand in hand you should avoid uh, them being on their own and uh, while you supervise uh, they should also be aware of these things uh, they they are not being aware at all thank you uh chaya would i like may i add to that uh one suggestion which i think a lot of people earlier you should follow is to put a pair of bangles or a anklets on your child's feet so that you always know where she is makes sense thanks a lot yeah okay there was one more question by Usha, it says, uh, "It asks uh, if rat snakes are there in the tent uh, in somewhere. Does it keep away the venomous ones?" I think I want to add to that question as well. I think a uh, lot of the times uh, when, uh, as a rescuer, when I go, the I think the most common question is, uh, "Why are we not relocating the non-venomous ones?" and uh, you know why do we have to leave them where they are um, so i think chant if you can yeah talk about that uh, i i think uh, this is a good question for you to jump in on prakriti like you've also had a lot of situations with this now i'll add to it but uh, please go ahead okay yeah i think um, uh, i mean that's um one of the thing that we always tell uh, people around uh, like we all already discussed i think snakes are territorial uh, they do have uh, uh, 
occupy a certain space move around in that uh, area uh, especially we've seen one uh, uh, one in mosaic which we have pretty much it covers like about 10 to 12 backyards and it keeps moving up and down a uh, uh, rat snake and uh, we haven't seen anything else apart from that so i think they are territorial and once if they are around then we will not see any other uh, venomous ones so that's uh, so it is uh, safe and of course if they are around uh, your rodent problems are taken care of so i think we should leave them Uh, sorry uh, sorry may i just ask something prakriti are you saying if rat snakes are there the venomous snakes wouldn't come around yeah so uh, maybe i'll just jump in quickly in that uh, uh, snakes do there are a certain number of uh, available spaces for the snakes to live in and if they are occupied by one species or by one individual then uh it that that space isn't free for another one unless it's forced out somehow so the logic here is that if you do uh, see non venomous snakes around your house then uh, it's likely that they are they've occupied a space and if you, they stay in that space then the harm the harmful ones can be kept at bay so yeah uh rat snakes could be preventing cobras from coming in uh smaller keelbacks could be preventing saw scale vipers from coming in uh you know the the could be the kukris i think uh, pr- could prevent uh, crates from taking up residence they both these are all snakes that have very very similar types of habitat preferences so yeah i would recommend that so uh, chain does it mean there's no kind of hierarchy between the snakes that the venomous are more stronger than the non venomous or anything like that I, I mean, that's I a agree. really that's a really interesting question. I don't know that there is a clear answer because yes, logically, like you know, a cobra has venom; it should be able to kill any other non-venomous snake around. Right. But uh, we've also I wish I had those photos loaded up to share, but uh, you can always look them up. Uh, there are these f- amazing photos of uh, rat snakes eating Russell's vipers. venomous snakes eating one another um there's a uh, there's a photograph of a large bullfrog that had that was consuming a russell's viper baby you know and in that case like the predator has become the prey so yes there's um, there might be a hierarchy but really we don't know what we can assume i guess is that snakes that have similar preferences in the space that they live and the food that they eat are about equal with one another i wouldn't say that the venomous ones have an advantage or a disadvantage i would in fact say that the non venomous ones end up becoming uh, species which are physically stronger because they don't have that uh, that thing the venom to fall back on so they have to be faster and they have to be stronger anyway would be the same but that's that makes a lot of sense thank you can i add anything uh, ha- hello go ahead go ahead go ahead please <laughs> wild malhar is command <laughs> okay i uh, one of the first sessions we had was uh, with a a uh, teacher from center for learning that's where chayan studied and uh, uh, she was actually a biology teacher and we felt uh, she would be able to talk about snakes and how to live with them and the point uh, she made was that at the end of the day uh, you can look at snakes from a utility point of view about uh, because they are useful we should have them or uh, the other way but i think uh, finally the question will be our own outlook uh, are we ready to live with other species or do you want to sanitize or make the earth such that only humans can live so and her point was that i think uh, we need to somewhere inculcate among our children and our neighborhood that all the other species are also part of us and uh we need to be able to live with them and uh, and if we educate ourselves we'll be able to 
live with them uh, uh, without harming ourselves or them. So uh, I thought that might, that was an interesting way to look at things. Yeah, I think the, the reason also that we had called her was uh, that the school that she was teaching at and that I went to is a place where, you know, we would regularly see, uh, we would see crates much more often than Malhar. We, we saw vipers, uh, Russell's vipers and cobras as well, and the odd saw scale viper as well. And, um, you know, there were children from the ages of, uh, you know, there were teachers' children who weren't even students. So there were children all the way from uh, uh, from toddlers to uh, uh, nearly school, high school graduates there. And uh, not once have we had a situation where, and of course, like, you can't control a school full of children as well as you can one, you know, your own your own child. So um, there were children running around without their footwear, without uh, torches at times, and we had to constantly remind them. But uh, touch wood again, no one has been bitten by, uh, no student has been bitten by a venomous snake to date. So that's, uh, I consider that not uh, something that's just happened out of luck. I think that's just also the nature of snakes. Uh, which is that they don't they don't uh, use their venom as uh, a defense usually it's not uh, it's not meant to be used on humans it's meant first and foremost for themselves to be able to catch and eat so i think when we look at it from that point of view um, it's easier to think about coexistence for a lot of people And uh, just uh, really quickly, for those of you who haven't, uh, who didn't know, because I think it's been a while since Kaman has gone for a rescue. Or, uh, he doesn't go that often these days, but um, he has rescued pretty much all the venomous species uh, that you find around Malhar uh, solo. And that's slowly becoming true of uh, a lot of the people on our group. So. Nandan, Prakriti, Satish, uh, Naresh, they're all, uh, of course, Prithvi is very experienced. And, uh, you know, we're, we have quite a few resource people now, which is something that I'm really happy about, which we didn't have five years ago. Uh, Chant, I have one more question. Yeah, go ahead, Sandra. Uh, in all these six years or seven years or however long Malhar has been action, active, do we have only one person who got bitten by a snake? I think it's two instances. One was in uh, resonance in 2017, and one was uh, in patterns in 2019. But there are, I've been bitten several times by the harmless snakes while trying to do a rescue. But uh, yeah, by, by potentially, by unknown or maybe venomous species, only twice. That's quite amazing, actually. I mean, if you consider how many people there are. Yeah, I, I would say so. And also how many snakes there are. Yes, if you got 30 in a few months, then I can imagine, yeah. Yeah, I, I, the 30 was uh, one month. More than 30 snakes in the same number of days. Really? 50 last month. Yeah, yeah. 51 in May. So, if uh, are there any more questions? Yeah, hi, Chant. Uh, this is Samrish. Hi, Samrish. I, uh, yeah, I wanted to make one observation. One lady was asking about uh, supervising her child while going out. She was uh, fourteen months old, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyways, one one observation was that generally children play in groups. So when they are playing in groups, making noises and, you know, uh, just making lots of commotion around, probably that is also one way that snakes won't be around that place. That's, uh, I don't understand snake that much, but having, uh, uh, having heard your uh, presentation throughout, I found it very useful and I think that is also something relevant. 
yeah. yeah one thing about snakes is uh, they can hear but they can hear very very low frequencies uh if i'm if i'm not wrong because i read in a book where they said uh, snakes are deaf but they are they can actually hear very low frequencies uh yeah the, they don't hear many high pitched sounds and all of that yeah but it's also a fact that 14 year, 14 month old toddlers wouldn't really play in groups it would be only yeah. when they became older no 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 I, no all i was saying is that no i'm talking to i'm telling for that oh, okay. the gentleman who said yeah uh, even the one bite we had in resonance was when kicks were playing and the ball went into the bush and they put a hand inside so you, you cannot discount the fact that they need to be careful one of the good things at least is most of the kids have actually been attending these sessions i don't know if there are a lot of kids in today's sessions but most of the kids actually are part of these training sessions and there was a special one which giant did for the kids a few years back and kids were enthusiastic about learning and being careful when they actually put their hands into bushes and things like that so that's an education which we need to give as parents and and as a community as well yeah maybe the onus can be uh, greater now since uh, you know i doubt uh, ch many children would have stayed through the entire session because it wasn't uh, that exciting as as it is in person. So um, may maybe the onus is greater on the adults here now to uh, speak to if you have children in the house or your child is interacting with other children. Like This is a good time to take some of the key takeaways and just speak to your child about it or uh, slowly build that into their play. Yeah, because it is true that maybe children do make quite a bit of noise when they're in groups, but uh, given that that uh, snake bite happened, I really wouldn't, uh, it's a huge risk. So Chant, one other question. This is Shreya again. Hi, so we had this uh, incident a couple of years back where we found snake eggs in our backyard. And I think this was likely to be the rat snake that lives around B and C clusters in mosaic. Uh, okay. So I'm in B7 mosaic. And at that time, so we still don't live there. We're weekenders and we come during the weekends. And those snake eggs were actually found by the daughter of a friend of ours who was two years old. Okay. She was going and playing around in the mud and, and she unearthed these eggs. And we didn't know what to do. So we sent her message on the general group and I think one of the gardeners came and took those eggs and took them away. Right. But I just wanted to understand what's the protocol if we find snake eggs. So one, do we just call one of you and is it possible to relocate them? And two, if we do relocate them, is it likely that the mother will come back? So what? how would you typically handle something like that? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the second part, which is, will the mother come back? So will the will the snake come back if you take the eggs away or is it better to leave them there, particularly if it's a non-venomous snake? Uh, so, I mean, unless you see the snake actually in the nest, the mother, you know, with the eggs, it's very hard to tell what species it is. Um, I would say if it's a quite an unlikely situation. Sometimes it's hard to tell that they're even snakes. Like they could be garden lizard eggs, which are quite similar. Um, so they, but yeah, rat snakes would probably be large eggs or cobras would be quite large eggs. If you do come across a snake nest, definitely inform the group because um, since they're underground, the only way you'll come across them is if they've been dug up in some way. Uh, so just to make sure that we can take a call collectively based on the situation. Uh, if it's a harmless species or people are okay or that house that it's happened, that the nest is in is uh, unoccupied, maybe they can be let, uh, you know, let be. Uh, and But if there's any perceived risk or if people are just uncomfortable, then we can try to send them to people who are more equipped to incubate them than we are. Because it is possible to hatch snakes from uh, eggs, but you do need to know, uh, you need to have some experience with it, uh, which we don't. Um, 
and as to whether the mother will come back well mothers will stay with the eggs depending on the species some of them will just lay them and uh, vanish but quite a few uh, snakes the mothers will stay with the eggs until just before they're about to hatch uh, and you know they'll transmit uh, heat that they've gotten from elsewhere onto their eggs in order to make sure that they're incubated so it is possible that a mother will come back looking for the eggs but if she doesn't find it she won't stay for long okay hey, thank you thanks sir and the eggs would be hatch somewhere else sorry would the eggs still hatch somewhere else uh that's up to the experience level of the person who's incubating but yeah generally snake eggs are uh, not hard to hatch okay jayant uh, i have a question um uh, there are like crocodiles and turtles they uh, their gender is determined by the temperature weather uh, in is it the same for snakes yeah that's uh, that's a nice question so maybe not everyone knows this but when turtles and crocodiles lay eggs as they just said uh, if they if there is a certain temperature the baby that hatches out of it will be a male and if it's a certain if it's a different temperature the baby will be a female so the sex is not determined when the egg is laid it's uh, environmentally determined from uh, what i know this isn't true for snakes uh i also think that people haven't we uh, i may not be familiar with the studies that uh, done it but what i read so far has said that it's not true for snakes at least not true for indian snakes also i've read something very uh, i don't remember very well but there is something very very uh uh unique about the worm snake how it's there like uh, there was something very unique i don't remember the point it was very very uh, like I, i i don't know how to put it like how uh, if you it used to give birth on its own without like a male it didn't have to be fertilized to give birth so, something like that i don't remember yeah it's a uh... Uh, tejas is talking about the brahmani worm snake which is uh, the smallest snake in india which i said uh, we we saw just a few days ago and it's a tiny snake and it's really special in many different ways but uh, one of the ways is what he's talking about here where all the individuals that have been collected and examined so far have all been female and it's one of the few snakes in the world which can reproduce without a mate so it's a process called uh, parthenogenesis and so young can develop from a parent that has never mated which is something that very few animals uh, especially reptiles can do it's quite cool it also means that all the young that uh, are born from a mother have exact uh, are are basically clones of her so yeah that's a cool quite a cool fact thank you so are there any more questions yeah uh, Jen, one yeah, question uh, this money here hi money uh, when you you said uh, about cutting the bite site and all that is not recommended tying a, a ligature above that's the first aid that is what is often at least when i learned uh, yeah. to prevent the uh, poison from spreading that's one part of the question second what has been the experience of going to bgs um, very briefly if you can say do they attend immediately or are there a lot of uh, bureaucracy involved and uh, was yeah yeah so first about the the ligature uh, also I, i think some people learned it as a tourniquet it's a it's a well known procedure but it's uh, it's potentially quite dangerous to apply one because you end up cutting off the the uh, you limit the venom to the that one area 
and that's supposed to keep it away from your heart i think that's the that's the reason people do, started doing it but um, the problem is for certain species like vipers their venom can destroy cells and muscle tissue so if you limit it if you get bitten on your hand or your leg you tie a tourniquet and that keeps the venom only here it also means it's extremely concentrated here and uh, there's a there can be a lot of permanent damage that happens because of it and part two once you remove the tourniquet which is usually a, at least an hour later or so when you're admitted and you're in the icu you can go into shock by the sudden delivery of it all so now what is recommended is you tie a loose sling so you if you're bitten on an appendage it's easier on a, on one of your limbs you tie a sling which is uh, not so tight that you you should still be able to slip your finger underneath it comfortably so the idea there is that it only uh, slows down the spread of lymph but it doesn't stop the blood flow and uh, most importantly you keep that uh, if it's your arm or your leg or whatever you keep it low below your heart and you keep it still so it's kind of like uh, getting a having a sprained arm or a strained leg you tie a light bandage which is not yeah, correct the bandage, bandage works fairly well like sorry i wasn't uh, i wasn't clear uh, chant i said you can use a crepe bandage the ones which we normally tie for a sprain yeah exactly you can tie a crepe bandage and uh, just make sure that it's not tied too tight uh sorry what what was the second yeah. question bgs uh, where about yeah. the hospital response understood yeah i only know of uh, uh this uh, shruti from patterns who went to bgs and she said that uh, they she felt forced into treatment without uh, getting even the blood test back so without um without be, uh without confirmation that there was venom in her blood uh it was insisted that she was uh, that she have her first dose of anti venom which uh, i don't know whether that's standard practice but um it usually doctors are instructed to give anti to administer anti venom um only when symptoms start presenting so patients are made are meant to be monitored only and early in earlier years they would do what's called a test dose where they would give a little bit of anti venom seems to gone now uh, come on you need to mute um and uh, but now that's discontinued so i don't know why they did that at bgs um i i think shruti was said that she was quite unhappy with her experience with them but uh, so now i do recommend fortis the highest and pfa has which is the uh, animal rescue and rehab shelter just next to bgs they also send all the rescuers if they get bit to fortis hospital even though bgs is literally walking distance away from them they have uh, been telling me for years not to go there thanks so, yeah okay so maybe uh, we're close to 1 pm now uh, so we probably have time for maybe one more question if at all you we'll take the uh, last one i think we uh, most people have also uh, okay maybe so we still have 134 participants uh, any any other questions it's not really a question bhaskar here just wanted to thank the whole team and chan for taking time off and real really interesting thank you bhaskar uh, i think i speak for all of us when i say like we really enjoyed doing this and you know being able to have these sessions with people it's more than just spreading information for us it's also a kind of community community building because yeah absolutely bhaskar with each session i think we're also uh, 
defining a mindset that we have towards not just snakes but wildlife in general. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but a huge thank you to all of you. It's been a terrific session. Yes. Thank you. I'd also like to thank uh, Prakriti and Srinandan and several others for organizing it and you know pushing for it. This is something that's been overdue for a long time. Uh, and of course, a huge hats off to all the people, uh, Tejas, Satish, Naresh, so many others uh, who come and attend every single rescue that they can. Prithvi, Vinay, uh, the list is huge, and um, uh, I won't, I won't like ramble on. But a huge thank you to everyone for being part of the team and helping, you know, continue to do this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, uh, this, uh, the response that we are seeing is fantastic. And this is something that we strive uh, to achieve where, uh, as a community, we are, uh, we are striving to become a lot more aware about our uh, 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 surroundings and uh, the other species that we live with and try and see how uh, well we can uh, coexist uh, ensuring safety as the biggest priority uh, for us as well as them. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Shreed. Thanks, Shayan. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks Bye -bye. for joining. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Shayan. Bye-bye. Bye. See you at the next one.